that even if you have the best diet in the world, other things can erode away at your immune system. Stress is probably the one thing. I know that it's something that you've written about a lot. And it's the one thing that we don't take seriously. We think of it as being psychological and the causes can be psychological. They can be physical. They can be emotional, but they're always biological because the stress chemistry is real. You know, your day job is about a subject that is really close to my heart, mm -hmm. immunology. Mm -hmm. Now, I did a BSc honours degree in immunology at university. Yeah. Uh, so I've always been fascinated with it. But I don't think I realised back then just how important it is for every single one of us. Yeah. You know, pretty much every chronic long-term health complaint stroke condition that we have, yeah. in many ways, the immune system plays a central role. And I don't think people realize that. No, no. Why do you think that might be? I mean, when I was an undergraduate and learning about the immune system, it was through the lens of infection protection. And that kind of is a historical thing you know, from maybe over a hundred years ago when the first kind of ties were made between these white blood cells and susceptibility to infection. And we've just always maintained this lens through which we look at the immune system as protecting us from infection. And then suddenly you start to dive into the field of immunology and you realize it's not just protecting us from infection, it's doing a whole array of other things. And I, I kind of... um like to move away from that military analogy we often have about the immune system as going out to battle off the germs, because most of the time it's not doing that. Most of the time it's kind of like your housekeeper, you know, it's just taking care, it's working hard, it's, it's learning from your environment inside and outside, and it's processing all that information and it's maintaining the kind of status quo yeah. in your body. Yeah, I like that. I, th I think a lot of us do think um, still to this day that Oh, if I get cold symptoms in November, mm -hmm. my immune system, in inverted commas, kicks in yes. to fight it off. Exactly. But the immune system is constantly running. It's constantly working. It? Yeah. Right now, as we sit here, it's working hard. It's involved in so many processes, you know, like cells in your body have a finite lifespan. So eventually they die and they have to be disposed of and special immune cells are removing those and keeping things tidy. They're repairing damage when it happens, yeah. even if there's no infection. So last year I broke my arm, but I didn't rip the skin open. There was no infection getting in there, but there was still signs of my immune system working hard to, to knit that all back together. Yeah. So it's, it's sensing, it's a real kind of, uh, it's like a mobile brain, I think. It's, it's very dynamic and it's listening, integrating all these signals from our environment, from inside us, and then producing the appropriate response to kind of keep things in balance. Yeah. And what's fascinating for me is that, and I hope we get into this today, is that it's not something passive that we have no influence over. There mm -hmm. is a lot that we can do, a lot of it quite simple stuff. Yes that can positively impact how our immune system works. Yes. And I know you've, you, you know, you, you, you basically done a fabulous job of summarizing it in your, in your book, Immunity, the Science of Staying Well, which is well worth a read, I think, for anyone who's interested mm -hmm. in learning more about the immune system and how they can use the lifestyle to help them. So mm -hmm. well done on such a great job. Thank you. Let's sort of dive in some. Should we, should we start with food? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think that's a good place to start. I put the food chapter at the end because I was really sick of seeing, you know, the whole immune boosting food supplement, whatever being pushed on, you know, the media, social media, everything. So I was kind of like, people are going to want to open a book about immunity and expect to see on like the first page, vitamin C does this to your yeah. immune cells. So take a vitamin C supplement or eat these vitamin C rich foods. And I kind of just wanted to emphasize, it's not that simple, you know, and, and almost um, make people look at the other aspects yeah. of life. I mean, before, before you dive into food, I, I just want to, I, I, I love that you did that. <laughs> and, um, it's what I did in the Four Pillar Plan, my first mm -hmm. book. I thought I'm not, people are expecting this will start with food. I'm not going to start with yeah. food. I'm going to start with stress because I think that's what no one's thinking about. Yeah. But then I'm interested. So you did that in your book, but when the book came out yeah. and you started to write 
you know, articles or a bit of yes. PR in newspaper columns, yes. I bet you, or I'm going to guess, what were they wanting you to say oh, and definitely. write about? Yeah, it was all about, you know, my book came out in March, which was, you know, COVID pandemic, you know, going through the roof. So all of the press and publicity was, you know, how can we make ourselves invincible to COVID? What what supplements can we take to be invincible? <laughs> and I was <laughs> going to let everyone down and say, well, you know, nothing's <laughs> going to make you invincible because <laughs> from the dawn of time, we've always had this battle with with germs, you know, like they're trying to infect us. We're trying to keep them out. We just cohabit this earth together. So there's always going to be infection yeah. and a pandemic's an unfortunate situation, but it's a very real one. Yeah. I mean, I'd love people just to sit with what you said there, which is we all cohabit this earth together, us mm -hmm. and the bugs. <laughs> you know, it's it's really quite profound that, mm -hmm. you know, it's not, I think humans, have, we've we've often felt, I think particularly in the times that I've been around on, on planet mm -hmm. earth, that, you know, we kind of know best and we sort of, we can dominate everything around yeah. us. But I think we're learning, well... We Mother, don't Mother, Nature's get it right. <laughs> Mother Nature's pretty powerful and have yeah. been around a long, long time. And there's yeah. there's a certain ebb and flow, and there's a certain dynamic. Mm -hmm. We are not the only um living species in the world. There's animals, yeah. there's bugs, and bugs, as no no doubt we'll get into. Yeah. Bugs are not all bad. There's a lot of bugs. Yes, exactly. They're very I mean, good. 99% of them won't hurt us, and they're everywhere. They're, you know, right now as we're sitting here. There's, there's bugs even in the air we breathe and they're not, you know, causing us harm. Yeah. So most of them are good, but there's the obvious ones that come along and, um, you know, sideswipe you like um, SARS-CoV-2 has yeah. uh, as a sort of reminder, a stark reminder that, yeah, infection protection is really important. Yeah, and I, th I, th I think the, the thing I would sort of reiterate to people is what I think the last few months have highlighted for mm -hmm. us is that looking after your immune system mm -hmm. is really important. Yes. And I would say, I've said it's a lot in the press, like taking care of your immune system is for life. It's not just for, for COVID. You know, suddenly everybody's really interested in it. There's lots of marketing of immune boosting products. You know, all of the supermarkets and, and pharmacies were sold out of vitamin C supplements at the start of the lockdown. Um, but it's something that we should all have been thinking of before COVID because it's, it's, it's for the long game, you know, immunity is really entwined with how we age. So, yeah. you know, if you want to live a long and, and healthy life, and we are as a population living much longer than the generations before us, but we're not necessarily living better. So if you want to, you know, I don't necessarily want to live forever, but I want to be able to enjoy my years and feel well and yeah. not be sort of burdened with chronic disease. And we can't bulletproof ourselves, but there's definitely things we can do now that, that are for the long game. And when I wrote the book, it was before we knew about um, the current coronavirus pandemic. So I was really hoping to try and get people thinking about the long game for their yeah. health. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, it, I'm sure in many ways, people, if they weren't going to take it seriously before, mm -hmm. are really going to now. So yeah. that would be our hope. So in terms of the things people can do, yeah. Uh, if we if we sort of dive into diet and food then, exactly. um, what are some of the things that people can do to help their immune system? Yeah, well, I mean, there's a, the sort of ones that people often think about, which is vitamins and minerals. And we have a whole um, selection of essential, we call them micronutrients. So the vitamins and minerals that we need to function. And if you're deficient in any of those, you will impair your immune system. And I think that there's certain ones that are highlighted. So vitamin A, the B vitamins, vitamin C, vitamin D, and vitamin E. But you could sort of say that taking more than than you need if you're not deficient isn't going to make your immune system work better than it already does at its baseline but the sort of subclinical deficiencies in our populations are not really clear it's very hard to measure you know if somebody has an overt deficiency in vitamin d you would see it clinically as rickets but if they're subclinically deficient that would sort of fly under the radar yeah. and being subclinically deficient is but in one micronutrient is often a sign that there's other micronutrients that might not be quite at the right um, yeah. levels. And I, I, for people who, I just want to clarify for people that subclinical, so, you know, 
a lot of people are used to getting blood tests mm -hmm. and there's a normal range. Mm -hmm. um, and often if you are with, you know, out with that normal range, you will be, it was said, you are deficient. Yeah. Um, but we're learning more and more like B12, for example, is a, a prime example for me that the normal range is so big. Yeah. You know, it's something like, you know, 200 ish to 700 or 800, depending on what lab you're mm -hmm. in. But for some people who are at 250, although it's technically normal, mm -hmm. actually it, they're symptomatic with it. Mm -hmm. Like they can have, um, you know, they can have all sorts of things, fatigue, they yeah. can have confusion, they can have muscle aches. And I really think medicine, I would say, has been quite black and white for mm -hmm. a number of years. I think we need to evolve a little bit to go, there's optimal. Yeah. You know, there's normal, there's abnormal, but there's also optimal. Yeah. And, 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 and I think, I think that's just a really important concept for people to grasp. Yeah. And I, you know, um, if you're, if you know, have problems with any of these micronutrients, the vitamins and minerals, it's going to impact your immune system. So it's not so simple as saying, I'll take a vitamin C supplement and that's going to make me more invincible. So it doesn't quite work like that. Um, the other thing about the micronutrients is, if we're low in any of those, it can actually increase oxidative stress in our body. So this is kind of the balance between oxidants and antioxidants. And what we've actually come to realize is this can affect how badly uh, an infection causes us symptoms. So if you're in a more oxidative state, so you're not... Um, your imbalance of antioxidants to oxidants is out, that bug, if you, if you catch a, an infection like you know, coronavirus, for example, it can cause a much worse pathology in you. And it can also cause that virus to be under a greater pressure to mutate, to become more virulent. So let's, let's take a, a winter flu, for example, a winter flu type virus that we are exposed to. Are you saying then that the state of your immune system at that time mm -hmm. potentially can influence whether you actually get sick with that infection yeah. or whether you fight it off with no yeah. problem. And how sick you get and whether you, the environment that your body provides when that infection is inside you can shape how that um, infection behaves, how that virus might be under a more pressure to mutate or more likely to mutate because of the, the environment of your body, which so is really... Is this why you can have 10 people in the same room with the same person with, let's say, a uh, cold virus coughing all over mm -hmm. 10 of them, but not all 10 will get symptoms of the virus, will they? Yes, exactly. And we've known this for a really long time, but I think coronavirus and the current pandemic has really kind of put that under the microscope because people are like, why are some people getting really, really sick and others have no symptoms? And yeah. this is quite commonly seen with infections that we have this huge diversity of yeah. how we respond. Now, now, you mentioned oxidative stress and this balance between the oxidative stress and the antioxidants. Mm -hmm. And what if you, we could just make that super clear for people? So what is oxidative stress exactly? So we have um, oxidative, like things that are, are produced when uh, like byproducts of, of our cells normally working, um, things in our environment, various different things can, can cause that oxidative yeah. stress in our body. And then we have our own internal antioxidant systems. We have the micronutrients, vitamins and minerals that support production of antioxidants. And we also get antioxidants from food. And we kind of need this to be in balance. So we don't want to completely extinguish the oxidative side and we don't want to um, have too few antioxidants because they both play roles in different ways. And just being alive and functioning mm -hmm. and going around your day yeah. today is going to increase oxidative stress, isn't yeah. it? Because it's a normal, it's like all these things you want it, you, as you say, it's a balance. You mm -hmm. want that, but you want enough going on in your lifestyle to balance that out. Is, yes. that, is that what I we're saying? I think that's a, a good way to put it. And Oxidative stress is something that our immune cells do when they're fighting an infection because they want to make our body's environment very hostile to the infection. So they produce all these kind of um, reactive oxygen species like free radicals and stuff to try and fight off infections and make that environment hostile. And then you have the antioxidants that's going to quench that and bring things back to normal once you no longer need to be fighting the infection. So is this why it's a good idea to eat uh, 
antioxidant rich foods because it helps with this balance exactly and a lot of the minerals and vitamins in our diet are sort of cofactors in all of the processes that are involved in achieving this balance and then you have all the kind of phytonutrients so these are plant chemicals that are not considered in the recommended daily allowance like we we don't have a sort of reference amount that you should be taking uh, and there's 20 odd thousand of them recorded so far so um they're kind of the, the the things that plants use as their own defense system because they cannot run away when an, a little um you know insect comes along and tries yeah. to bite it so they'll produce their own little chemicals phytochemicals that will try and uh, make it hostile and when we eat these they help our own internal antioxidant systems and they also have their antioxidant properties themselves wow. so that's why we should focus on like a plant-rich diet and most of these phytonutrients are found in the pigments of different plants so something i do with my kids is that we talk about eating different colors and you know red fruits and vegetables we have leafy greens orange fruits and vegetables um yellow then even like the browns and whites like cauliflower and those kind of things um and uh, the purples and the blacks, you know, the real uh, that are found in berries and kind of trying to eat from a whole range of these foods rather than focusing on one particular phytonutrient like curcumin and turmeric. So that's one that we commonly see in the sort of wellness arena that people take um, supplements of yeah. this. And I think the, the uh, most uh, sort of basic thing that you should think about is that they work in concert like an orchestra so you don't want to isolate one particular phytonutrient or antioxidant and put it in a pill and take it because you might actually be removing some of its power because it's not being consumed in situ of all the other phytonutrients and um, parts of your diet that help with that digestion and absorption so I think food first food first is what everyone should be thinking of when it comes to their immune system. Trying to get your nutrition from food so that you're not deficient in any of the micronutrients, which are the vitamins and minerals, and then getting all these phytonutrients, which are kind of like the icing on the cake to really um, nourish our immune system. And they have their own natural antioxidant properties. Some of them are antimicrobial, antibacterial, anti-inflammatory, and they're often considered longevity compounds. So we know that we don't need a certain amount to be able to function, but we know that over the course of a life, time they're very important yeah. for longevity so I, I you know food first seems really simple and if you have a chronic condition or some underlying health problem then you might that might not be an approach that works for you but i think that is the best thing that we can sort of aim for i think that's a nice approach it's it's saying look there may be some value in some supplements at some time depending on your mm-hmm. state of health but let's get the basics right first yeah. let's focus on food yeah. first and it's the pattern of the, your diet it's the consistency it's not what you ate this morning but what did you eat all week what did you eat all month you know maybe you had a few meals that were not the best but if the majority if the pattern overall is is strong then i think that's that's what you need to be looking at rather than getting stressed about every meal being perfect yeah and that's a very empowering message i think for people because you know we are living in stressful times people mm-hmm do sometimes struggle with energy or motivation Mm -hmm. to, you know, cook that perfect meal that they want to. But your approach is saying, look, that's okay, right? Don't beat yourself up. If if now and again, you have a meal that isn't, let's say, what you would ideally have, okay, fine, maybe enjoy it, you know, don't, don't feel guilty about it. Yes. But try to make most of your meals as much as possible. Yes, exactly. Um, You know, natural minimally mm-hmm. processed foods i would like i think so one of the one of the tips you're saying is colors focus on as many ma- different colors yep exactly rather than maxing out on one color yes. you're saying go for a variety go for a variety and the other thing is you know food when you focus on food first it's it's conveniently packaged up with other things that your body needs and one of the key things that is often not linked to your immune system but i'd say it's like massive for the the resilience of your immune system is fiber so pills and and potions and whatever are not full of fiber but the fresh produce is full of fiber and people might be thinking why is fiber important for your immune system because you're gut bugs 
the microbiota at the interface of your digestion and the rest of your body are one of the key educators of the immune system. And again, this is something that's probably exploded in the field of, of immunology in yeah. the last 10, 15 years. If you do not, so if you take a, an experimental uh, animal model where the animals have a, a reduced or a minimal um, collection of good bacteria in their gut, their immune system doesn't develop. And they're very impaired in how they can respond and heal. Um, and even things like, you know, protection from cancer because our immune system is the main cancer surveillance system. So these bugs are helping to educate and teach and mature our immune system. And this happens potentially in utero before we're born, but predominantly when we enter the world because we go from a relatively sterile, there is some evidence that there may be yeah. some bugs in the placenta. Uh, but we go into this hugely germy world and suddenly our immune system has to cope with that because, you know, it, it's, um, it's got all these receptors on it to, to detect pathogens as being problematic. So it has to learn to tolerate those because, you know, most of the bugs around us are safe and harmless and we need them because they're helping us. And that's actually how the immune system develops, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It is by exposure mm -hmm. to the environment around it, to exactly. the bugs around it, to sort of give it that sort of ongoing education yeah. so it starts to learn, oh, I respond to this, I yeah. don't need to respond to that. Exactly. Um, I often say that, you know, the immune system's made, it's not born. There's maybe a percentage in the genetics that we inherit, but then it's made, it's built throughout our life and it changes throughout our life. So That's a lovely idea. It's yeah. made, not born. We can, we can build and we can sort of develop it mm -hmm. the way we want to if we give it if the we, right yeah. inputs. inputs. Yeah. And I, I often think about the inputs as a way to shape the immune system. And I was trying, I was working on a talk the other day and I was trying to make a slide of all the inputs, some that we can control, some that we can't, that, that are shaping our immune system from birth. And then it just, this became a really busy, messy slide <laughs> because there was too much to put on there. But yeah, a, a lot of it happens in childhood. And in some ways I find that quite daunting as a mother and you think well you know there's sort of first three years I would say is when you're being colonized by all these good bacteria and there's huge changes going on in the immune system during that time yeah. um, and there's this kind of interaction happening these bacteria they help protect the gut barrier to keep it very nice and, and tight and stop any bacteria going into the body because they're only good bacteria if they're in the right location. So they're not meant to cross over the gut and enter our body yeah. um, because then they, they become a problem. Um, but one of the biggest things that they're doing to help our immune system is they're, they're eating our foods. And I often think your diet's only as good as your microbiota in your gut because yeah. they are, they're the interface. They're eating your food. They're helping you to produce these vitamins and minerals from your diet, but they're also producing these postbiotics. Um, and people might have heard of prebiotics and probiotics, but postbiotics are basically the metabolic waste of the bugs in your gut. So they're producing stuff. That is their kind of, you know, waste product of eating your foods. Like short chain fatty acids. Short chain fatty acids yeah. is the classic one. I, I used to work on these when I lived in Switzerland um, and looking at how they influence um, inflammation in the gut and beyond. So short chain fatty acids are kind of a metabolic byproduct of the, the bugs in your gut. And they directly bind to uh, the immune cells at that site and they help educate them and teach them to, to sort of tolerate anything that you're throwing down your mouth because we're not supposed to um, react to that because it should be, you know, benign things that are going in there. But they have to help strike that balance that if you did get some kind of food poisoning, they also can identify the bad bugs. Yeah. So they help create an environment that's what we call tolerogenic. So it's encouraging um, tolerance of the food that you're eating. And there's a very kind of dynamic interaction between these bugs and the immune cells. And I'd say what happens in the gut is not just staying there. This um, 
influence, this sort of tolerogenic influence of yeah. things like short chain fatty acids is also being absorbed into your bloodstream and helping regulate the immune system at, at distal sites from what, the what, gut as well. It helps make T regulatory cells, yes, doesn't it? Exactly. Which, as you the said before, it's the, there was, I think, I, I mean, you mentioned the term peacekeeper. I think the first time I read that, I think it was in a nature paper in 2014, I think. Mm -hmm. I think. I think I use that in one of my slide decks. It's where it calls them our peacekeepers. Yeah. I think for the first time when I saw it in print, yeah. um, which is kind of what they are. Yeah. Really. And and I I sort of, yeah, I mean, I th I really think we, a lot of people talk about gut health these days, but I don't think people understand the immune system's linked to, you know, yes. they think the gut yeah. is something separate, but I, I often teach... Uh, doctors about this triad between our diet, our Im uh, our gut bugs, mm -hmm. and our immune system, and how they all sort of cross talk. Oh, definitely. You know, there's, yeah. There's bi-directional communication between you know diets and gut bugs, diets and immune system, mm -hmm. and gut bugs and immune system together. Yes. It's like this. So you know, if you if you make certain dietary choices, you're going to improve mm -hmm. the health of your gut bugs, which is going to improve the health of your immune system. Yes, exactly. Which is empowering, right? Because yep. we can do something about that. Yes, exactly. And I think as a nation, we're not eating enough fiber. And also fiber in the UK has a really bad like image problem, I think. Like most people, I think- Come on, let's give it some PR. Yeah, give it, if, give I, it. <laughs> if I was to ask my husband what he thinks fiber is, and he, he's not in any kind of medical, nutrition wellness field he'd um in fact the other day he came home with some crackers that said he's like look they say they've got added fiber <laughs> and i was like okay <laughs> because we kind of think of it as being like you know cardboard. those bread bre breakfast cereals like cardboard with the big fiber logo yeah. on it and um or fiber as being one thing yeah. but again it's the diversity different bugs need different forms of fiber and it, we find it in all the plant-based foods so it's not just the fruits and vegetables nuts and seeds legumes beans pulses and and whole grains yeah. and it's about trying to bring in the diversity i think in the last few years there's a, a publication about the sort of thir trying to get 30 different plant-based foods yeah. into your diet because it's, per it's about per week yeah because it's about the diversity but that it. also it's that includes i think lentils and mm -hmm. nuts yeah uh, you know and you know I, I think it's very achievable yeah once people have it in their mind exactly to, yeah to do it and they're very common in in traditional diets i remember growing up you know my mum would would add lots of different um, grains and beans and pulses to spin things out, as she put it, so that you yeah. could make a dish go a lot further. Yeah, wonderful advice. Um, so, so far, we've said that lots of different colors, lots mm -hmm. of different diversity of plants is going to help your gut microbiome, it's going to mm -hmm. help your immune system. Mm -hmm. Eating less mm -hmm. is also something that might be helpful, right? Yeah. So, this is another field I've, I've just got fascinated with. Um, and that's the, the immunometabolism. I don't know if you've heard anything I about this. I love that word. Yeah. Love it. Immunometabolism. <laughs> Shipping two words together. Yeah, yeah. I like it. And it's only just in the five, last five years that it's really kind of popped up um, and people have started looking at this. But metabolism, metabolism is basically breaking down of um, the major components of our diet, so the protein, carbohydrate, and fats, into energy and building blocks that our cells can use. And people might hear things about metabolic rate or I've got a good metabolism, these kind of things that people say. Um, and, you know, metabolism and the immune system are really intimately entwined. And I don't know why it's taken us so long to figure that out because immune responses are energetically very costly. You know, there has to be sort of triaging of resources to be like, right, we're going to fight this infection and turn on all the inflammation, turn on all the antibody producing and all those molecules that are being produced and the proliferation of, of immune cells. That takes a lot of resources. So it needs it's energy, it needs building blocks. Is this why we feel tired when we're fighting an infection? Because the body's diverting resource yeah. to 
making all that stuff that's exactly. going to fight it. Exactly. And you might find that you need to kind of build yourself back up again after you've been uh, sick, um, particularly if you've yeah. been sick for quite a long time or if you have an ongoing illness, your nutritional needs might be very different from somebody who doesn't have that. So Im immunometabolism is the field that's trying to understand how metabolism can shape immune responses and vice versa. So this happens at the level of the individual immune cell, but also can happen in the environment of a tissue and an environment of our whole body. And this is something that there's not really any kind of absolute concrete um, understanding yet in this area. But we know that when uh, uh, an immune cell is fighting an infection, it goes through a metabolic switch. And it goes from being in this kind of resting state to suddenly sucking up lots more um, glucose to fuel uh, proliferation. The, the immune cells are making armies of themselves. Building antibodies requires, you know, the building blocks of proteins, all of this kind of thing. It's happening. And that metabolic switch is, is known as the Warburg effect. This is also what's happening to cancer cells. But immune cells do this when, and it's perfectly normal when they're fighting an infection or fighting any kind of, um, um, problem. And then it switched back off and the immune cells go back to normal and they're, they don't have this huge need for metabolites anymore. But what people are starting to, to wonder is, can the overall environment of a body influence um the the metabolic switches inside our immune cells and switch them on aberrantly when they're not needed so we know that um, diabetics with poorly controlled blood sugar so they have elevated blood sugar in um, their body this creates an environment that causes some of our immune cells like neutrophils to not work so well so it affects so immune cells have nutrient sensing um um, switches inside them so they can sense what nutrients are, in, are are available and they're taking in that information and then that affects how they can work now what is not known is can we feed someone different um, macronutrients proteins carbs or fats and influence how their immune system is working so can you switch unwanted immune responses off or on based on the different macronutrients that your body's metabolizing and i think this is where the field of immunology is going to be headed in terms of treating chronic diseases because we know that people with chronic diseases like metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, or people who are carrying too much visceral fat, that the whole environment of their bodies is metabolically different. And this might be causing the immune cells to act abnormally and be, become more pro-inflammatory, for example. Wow. Super interesting. Yeah. So a lot of research to come in that area. Exactly. And I think we just don't know enough to say yeah. specifics yet. But I think that's, you know, for so long we've been focused on the micronutrients, but actually it's the macronutrients. So you could adjust someone's diet, give them different proportions of protein, fat and carb to maybe alter their metabolism and alter immune cells that were going wrong. So somebody who had a chronic inflammatory disease, we could kind of steer that around. It's and incredibly exciting, isn't it? On the other side of it, what you said about eating less, um, another thing that I bring up in the book because I wanted to get people away from just thinking about, you know, a vitamin supplement for their immune system is that the immune function is impacted by overnutrition and undernutrition. So if you're not eating enough or you're eating too much, this is going to send your immune system awry. And I should context that by saying, if you're doing that consistently. And then we have this field of research coming out about fasting and immune function. And I remember being at conferences decades ago, and they were talking about fasting and how it would regenerate um, all sorts of parts of the body. It was kind of mind blowing. And now we kind of see it more in the mainstream and we have all these kind of forms of different diets. Um, and this again is causing metabolic switches in the body that then when you go on to refeed after someone has had a period without food, you get increase in, in growth hormone, you get production of fresh new immune cells from the bone marrow. Um, and the stress of the lack of eating 
kind of causes some of the older immune cells and ones that might be more likely to malfunction to be deleted. So you're kind of replenishing your immune system. And we start to see in experimental models of autoimmune disease that this is, you know, highly therapeutic. Yeah, it's fascinating that it's not necessarily just what we're eating. Mm -hmm. It's you know how much or how little. It's are we fasting? Are we not fasting? Mm-hmm. All these kind of different components that yeah. all play. I guess they all play a role in the signals the body is receiving. Because I guess that's all it is, isn't it? The immune mm-hmm. system is trying to interpret the signals yeah. and sort of going, okay, what does that mean? Is it is yeah. it sort of safe or is it unsafe? Do I need to take action? Yes. Or can I just stay calm? Exactly. And I guess everything we do. Even our thoughts, our words, Mm -hmm. our sleep, our stress, Mm -hmm. they're all giving a signal in some way to our immune system. Exactly. Do I need to respond or is it okay? Exactly. Yeah. It's 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 always it's that simple, isn't it? At its core. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's it's this decision making that's ongoing and constant. It's integrating all these different inputs to decide. And I think the thing with the, the sort of so-called western diets that that you know we talk about as being having a negative impact on our health um it's just it's just really tasty and we just want to eat it all the time it's salty it's sweet it's delicious it's everywhere we can quickly override any lack of hunger cues just to 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 eat we kind of pathologize being hungry it's like you're not ever allowed to be hungry you have to have 10 snacks in your bag in case you might not be able to reach some food and and then we have millions of incidences of eating across a huge portion of our waking time. And part of the research I was involved in several years ago was looking at postprandial inflammation. So when we eat, there's an inflammation, a subtle inflammation that happens in the body. And this is quite normal. We have plenty of checks and balances in place to keep that in check. And actually dietary fiber is one of the best ways to kind of seal that up again and prevent that from happening, as is having a period of um, time without food in between meals. So eating enough and the right things at one meal that you do not need to eat then till the next meal um, is actually quite good for over- overall yeah. gut health, but the whole body health. I, I, I'm sort of super fascinated by this research as well. And, you know, not only do many of us eat too much, we eat too often mm-hmm. in the day. And as you just said there, you know, that the act of eating is inflammatory yeah. so that's a response to eating is that your body will become inflamed as you say nothing to worry about it's sort of that's part yeah. of the process but i guess you know and you know i know uh sachin panda's done a, a lot of look at this yes. professor panda um and i think when when he started his app in 2015 i think it's called my circadian clock mm-hmm. I, I, I can't remember the figures offhand, but it's something like 20, 30 years ago, most people were eating three times a day in mm-hmm. the US. I think yeah. we can probably infer in the UK as well. And then in 2015, when he was measuring mm-hmm. and people were inputting into the app, I think the top 10% of people were eating 15 times a day. And it was a, yeah. you know, so that, if we think about that, let's say, Let's say I'm eating 15 times a day. And let's say, in theory, it is all whole food, right? It's all nice uh, health. Well, what What is considered, yeah. you know, you've got to be careful with the language, but what is considered sort of helpful yeah. foods for our health? You do have to ask the question, is eating them 15 times a day helpful? That's That's like 15 bouts of inflammation. Whereas if you had the same sort of food over... You know, it's it's not a perfect analogy, but three times a day over five days, you're still getting 15 bouts of inflammation, mm-hmm. but that's over the whole week, yeah. As opposed to in just one day, and I, I really do think societally, culturally, there's a problem with how much we're being encouraged to eat, even mm-hmm. healthy foods. Like you can buy yes. healthy snacks here and healthy yeah. snacks there, but you're you're sort of inflaming yourself each time, and exactly. I, I don't know what, what what would you make of that? Yeah, no, I think that's a real uh, issue. I think it's not well enough understood in the scientific community to really translate into a kind of clear health message for people. But from the research I was involved in and from work like what Sachin Panda has done and others, I definitely think we need to look at the incidence of eating as well as, um, 
you know, the, the stretch of time that we're eating. I think some of the studies show that we're spending 18 hours a day eating. Yeah. It's just like the whole time we're awake. Um, and I don't think that we are sort of designed to cope with that on a long-term consistent basis. You know, going back to the traditional diets, I, you know, my grandparents weren't eating all day, every day, um, because it, that just wasn't how it was constructed. And different cultures will eat in different ways, but it certainly it's not common to eat all the time. And I, I want to fuse the tradition with the modern life somehow, because I think that's the key that we need. We can't go back to times gone yeah. by, but we can bring bits that we've left behind and kind of integrate it into what we have to work with right now somehow. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I find a very effective and powerful recommendation I use to my patients mm -hmm. is uh, to try not to eat for 12 hours and every 24 hours. So, uh, you know, basically eating all your food within a 12 hour window, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, really was the norm for pretty much yeah. everyone maybe 30, 40 years ago. I mean, yeah. you know, we, we might stop eating at 8 PM mm -hmm. and maybe we wouldn't have breakfast till eight. I yeah. mean, I'm, I'm not talking about an extreme fast. I'm just no. saying, I, say, I think it's quite, I certainly know when I uh, manage to stick to that consistently. Mm -hmm. I sleep better. I feel more energetic. Yeah. And I think there really is this idea that, you know, you need time for the body to regenerate a little bit. Your, mm -hmm. If your gut is constantly having to use up energy to yes. constantly digest food, that's going to impact your immune system. It's going to mm -hmm. impact, you know, the resource it has for something else, right? Yes, exactly. There's, um, you know, the, the gut lining as well. There is a kind of, um, uh, it's energetically costly because it's, there's a turnover of those cells quite regularly. And things like the short chain fatty acids we mentioned earlier that are produced when our gut bugs digest fiber, they are really nurturing to uh, the growth of and repair of the, the cells that line the gut yeah. barrier. And those are kind of the interface cells between what's going on in the gut and what's being put in the bloodstream that could exacerbate that inflammation. And we know that certain things like um, saturated fats, um, high fructose diets, um, fiber poor diets, um, as well as other things like stress and extreme exercise can uh, alter the integrity of that gut barrier yeah. and exacerbate this sort of inflammation that you see postprandially. Um, and I know that some of the work that Tim Spector recently published um, looked at postprandial inflammation and looked at also people's microbiomes yeah. and found that the same food did vastly different things in different people, which is why we have to kind of have a bit of intuition of our own bodies and how we're feeling. How do we feel after we eat and not, you know, just be eating something because our friends are eating it. I know we have our kind of eat well guide and the public health messages, which are kind of good to give the whole population um, a safety net against certain diseases. But I guess we don't all have access no. to personalized nutrition, but we all have a very personal response to food. And we can't just say, don't eat that because that's inflammatory. It might be in you and it might be not the same it's, in me. Yeah, it's, 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 you know, as an ideology, like these public health guides it's tricky, actually, because I get what you're saying. I get what the idea is to give a bit of a safety net. And I guess the way I sort of feel more these days is, have we sort of disempowered individuals by doing that, sort of mm -hmm. by saying this is the way one should eat? When it's kind of, it's always been passed down, hasn't it, from... Mm -hmm you know, parents to child, from grandparents to mm -hmm. grandchild. It's like, this is how you eat. And, you know, I'm not expecting an answer from you. Appreciate, you know, <laughs> you're, a, you're a lecturer and you, you know, may not wish to get drawn into this, but I'm just sort of sharing my perspective is I sort of get that, but I think we've lost touch with ourselves. Like, Definitely. I think, you know, the conversation I had this morning here was mm -hmm. with someone called Pippa Grange, who mm -hmm. is an amazing psychologist. She works with the England football team. Mm -hmm. She's, you know, all kinds of high-powered business. But we were really talking about um, kind of intuition, but, mm -hmm. but spending time understanding yourself and really mm -hmm. sitting with how you feel. So making that relevant to what we're talking about, yeah. this idea that trying to tap into, oh, when I eat this sort of meal, oh, I've got more energy. I sleep better. Mm -hmm. My gut feels better. I actually personally think 
and this is probably different from 10 years ago as a doctor, mm-hmm. probably evolved the more patients I see, but I sort of feel that's, I think, where the power lies for people is to, yeah, get a bit of guidance, mm-hmm. understand some principles, yeah. but then sort of within those principles, kind of figure it out for yourself, yeah. like experiment and see how you feel. There's no, there's no better tool than actually figuring out yourself. Hey, when I eat that, I get bloated afterwards. I don't sleep well. But when I don't have that or I have this, I feel fine. I think that is very powerful. But Mm -hmm. I think half the problem is with many people are too busy to actually tune into how they're feeling. Definitely. I think that's something I've learned as I've got older. But I can definitely see how there was points in my life when I was too busy to really, uh, you know, and and I'd be eating on the go um, years ago when I lived in London. And that just became really normal. And I remember speaking to my um, uh, great grandmother and she was like, in our day, it was, a, you know, it was unheard of to eat and be on the bus or be walking around. You sat down to eat and she was outraged by all the young people eating on the go and just kind of got a point just because point. now I just avoid eating on the go because I I don't like how it, I feel, you know, it, it, it's rushed and I'm not really chewing my food properly. It's, it's and mindless eating. It's not a very nice environment sitting on a bus or somewhere. I just wait till I get to the other end. And given that's not always possible, but I think we have become, you know, we definitely pathologize feeling hungry. Like yeah. most of us are not going to keel over if we don't snack in between our yeah. next meal. Or maybe maybe you might keel over because your blood sugar balance has kind of yeah, gone but, awry but, because but, you've... Exactly, yeah. because you're metabolically sort of I don't like the term broken so much, but because there's there's some sort of yeah. dysfunction there metabolically exactly. that we can hopefully fix, but that may be why you need to eat every two hours. Yes, you yeah. Know, maybe if the, the, the metabolism is working more optimally, yeah. you wouldn't need to. Let's get some more practical things. Um, mm-hmm. I think you, you've really helped people understand the immune system, how important mm-hmm. it is. So food so far has been potentially... Think about how often you're eating, Mm -hmm. uh, how much you're eating, how you're eating, but also this diversity. You did mention saturated fats. Um, Let's just quickly go through the macronutrients then. Because there was a really nice bit in the book about protein and immunity, which I found really interesting. Um, But saturated fat is is a very hot topic of Mm -hmm. conversation and uh, how can I put it, the Twitter diets wars. Yes. Um, (laughs) Definitely steer clear of those. Yeah, I, I, I do these days. I'm just like, okay, I'm, I'm over it really. I, sort yeah. of, I don't find it particularly helpful. Um, but also when we talk about saturated fat, there's so many different types of saturated fat. It gets quite a nuanced mm-hmm. discussion. But I wonder if you could, let's talk about protein. Maybe we mm-hmm. could talk about fats and carbs and actually yeah. how you see them impacting the immune system. Exactly. So I think carbs is the quality and the quantity. So these are where we're getting the fiber to feed our microbiota. So um, thinking of that diverse, colorful produce that we're trying to eat 30 different plant foods and over the course of a week. Um, carbohydrates are fueling our immune responses. Um, and then protein. I think protein malnutrition is probably globally one of the biggest factors that has a negative impact on our immune system because it's it's protein breaks down into amino acids and these are the building blocks to make so many other proteins in our bodies and the immune system is a huge sink for that because it needs you know antibodies are made from protein the communication molecules so we are need made protein, from protein for the fabric of yeah, our immune system exactly yeah and I think you know. That's probably one of the key things, as I said, globally that impacts our immunity. Uh, What's sort of less understood is which particular amino acids, these building blocks of proteins are more or less uh, important for different aspects of the immune system. And I think that's something we'll see coming out in the next few years under this kind of immunometabolism field. Um, I think you beautifully addressed animal versus plants uh, in, in the book where you said, you know, animal proteins are typically more complete yeah but plant-based proteins a lot of cultures have actually learned how to combine them yeah to give you that completeness and i thought that was a very inclusive and a very empowering way because people you know people these days are choosing to eat yes. in very different ways and yeah. of course 
choosing how you eat. So it's a very modern, it's quite a privileged phenomenon in yeah. the first place to be able to choose exactly. the diet you wish to follow. Yeah. Um, but I thought it was really nice how you did that. Yeah. And what are some of those examples of combining? So I think um, I think rice and beans I think you is put a that good in, one. Yeah. yeah. And, and you find these in sort of different uh, cultural diets as well. And the complete proteins, the complete proteins are the ones that contain all of the amino acids that are considered essential. We cannot make them ourselves. And then there's certain amino acids that we can make ourselves. Um, and there's some that are conditionally essential. So in certain situations, yeah. they become essential. So most animal products tend to, um, you know, generally speaking, contain all the essential ones, whereas most plant products tend to only contain some or other of them, but you can piece them together. And I think anyone who's switching uh, out all animal products for plant-based uh, protein sources should really make sure they get some sort of nutritional advice to ensure that they're not lacking in any of these amino acids. And, they, and, and study traditional diets, I guess, mm -hmm. or traditional cultures yeah. who eat that way. You know, there is a lot of kind of ancestral wisdom there mm -hmm. that we've known as humans before that yeah. we've sort of forgotten, Maybe right? it's the human condition, you know, like when <laughs> our parents try and tell us stuff and we're like, no, we'll do it anyway. Yeah. Um, and then we're like, oh yes, they were right. That's what they were trying to tell us. So yeah. I think we all know that. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, so what, what's the deal with fats then? So fats, um, I think for a long time, we kind of thought of fat as one thing, but it's not. It's lots of different things. Um, there's the unsaturated fat. Fats. So there's the mono and the polyunsaturated fats. So olive oil is probably the best example of a mono unsaturated fat. And there's lots of um, epidemiological research around why it's important for health. And it has lots of these phytonutrients that I mentioned earlier included in it. And my own personal bias because of my hybrid uh, Italian family is like, you know, oil, olive oil is life. <laughs> so it's all that I use. And um, yeah, hold my hands up to that. Um, so it's, it's something that's um, really important to include uh, in your diet. I think people get afraid of cooking with olive oil, but it's for the short term sort of home cooking. It's been shown to be stabilized by the presence of these phytonutrients. Yeah. So it's, it's a good healthful oil to use. And, you know, people have been using it for millennia and uh, it's associated with some of the most healthful diets in the world, like the Mediterranean region. Um, then the polyunsaturated fats are kind of interesting because you have the omega-3 and the omega-6. So some people might be familiar with these. Omega-3 supplements are quite popular now. Um, and I would say th if you're not eating oily fish, then you should really think about an omega-3 supplement because these are... They're making up the, the, the cell membranes of our, our cells, but their immune system is using these as a resource to produce different um, molecules that it uses to do its job. And um, this includes production of inflammation, but also resolution of inflammation. And resolution of inflammation was something that was really neglected in the, the field for a long time. It's only maybe 10 years ago that we started to understand, oh, it's an active process. Inflammation just, just doesn't go away by itself. Simply the act of having inflammation in the body, having the presence of certain inflammatory cell types causes the switch to the next phase, um, which is the pro-resolving um, resolution of inflammation, which is healing and repair. And this is where our immune cells utilize these omega-3 fats from their cell membrane to produce pro-resolving molecules that help dampen down this and and heal and repair the the body that that is super fascinating so you know we we, we were saying at the start that inflammation is a normal process mm -hmm. you know it's but it's it's meant to be short-lived so it's mm -hmm. meant to be there to help you fight something like a you know a broken ankle you yes. know sorry sprained ankle you don't mm -hmm. get red hot yes swollen for a few days and then it resolves yeah. the the chronic inflammation the chronic unresolved inflammation that's behind you know, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, yeah. a lot of cases of depression, yes. all kinds of autoimmune diseases yeah. is a sort of chronic unresolved inflammation. And you're mm -hmm. saying that omega-3s help to resolve inflammation. Yes. Which is, which is you know, it's, it's quite nice actually to be able to draw a direct yeah. sort of link. So, oh, that's going to help me, you know, 
in, in colloquial terms, switches off, I guess, yes. to a certain degree. And you have to also consider whatever stimulating the inflammation in the first place needs to be somehow removed or yeah. contained as well. There's a lot of studies in things like heart disease, depression. I think probably um, rheumatoid arthritis is one that springs to mind because there's, you know, dozens of um, uh, clinical trials now that show that high doses of omega-3 is really be beneficial to the overall um, patient's quality of life and, you know, their pain and um, disease management. But yet the NICE guidelines are still not suggesting that we treat people with this. It's still that they're welcome to explore something like a Mediterranean diet. So for me, rheumatoid arthritis is the one that holds the strongest evidence, but it's just challenging to get that into clinical practice, I think. There's also things like allergies where omega-3s, the, the evidence is really quite mixed, but we have a sort of picture appearing where what the mother is eating when she's pregnant and the fish, um, which is a great source of omega-3s, is really important to help prevent allergies in the unborn child. So again, not a really strong um, clinical message yet, but I think that's some something that we're going to see coming out in the next few years. Yeah, and I think, you know, this is one of the big problems at the moment is with how information is communicated. Mm -hmm. um, we can easily get overexcited by yeah. certain things. But at the same time, I also think we put the brakes on a lot of things as well, of course, we often need more evidence, but I also think sometimes with some things, mm -hmm. when the risk of harm is low, yeah. we should really be starting to think about, well, look, and when, you, when, for example, we say mixed evidence, that implies, well, some evidence is suggesting it may yeah. work and some is suggesting it, it's not. So it could be that in certain populations, yes. it works brilliantly. Exactly. And in other populations, it doesn't work at all. But no, we're going to have a global recommendation that you don't do it because we don't have the evidence. Yeah. And I just don't think it's... I really think we need to think about a better way sometimes to communicate some yeah. of this with the public. It's really hard, especially, you know, the thing with pregnant women and, and fish, because there's mixed messages about how much fish pregnant women should mercury intake because and, of mercury. Yeah. But yet we, we're we starting to see a picture where having omega-3s are really important during pregnancy, but pregnant women might decide to not eat fish at all during pregnancy rather than the kind of gray area of you're allowed so many portions, but not yeah. this fish and only so many times a week. Um, and in which case, then maybe a supplement would be suitable, but that's not, again, it's, it's very difficult to communicate yeah. Um, this kind of information into very clear yeah. public health messages. In terms of saturated fats, mm -hmm. um, you have written about this in the book. Uh, I think you cover it really well. Um, as I say, there's lots of different kinds of saturated fats. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes I, I find it confusing in the literature as to it's a specific type or they often it's an animal study with a high sucrose, high saturated yeah. fat diet. So you're conf one might be confusing sort of the high sugar and the high fat exactly. diet in combination. And I, I sort of think some people seem to be do okay with a little bit of saturated fat in the context of a natural yeah. sort of more traditional diet. And I think that's exactly. where, and as you yourself said at the start, it's very hard when we just go to individual yeah. nutrients and try and say good or bad. Exactly. It's kind of a lot more nuanced. Yeah. So we do know that saturated fat can be something that causes the gut barrier to open up uh, more than other um, foods. And that in itself can cause this sort of transient post, post eating inflammation. But we also know that eating it in the context of a fiber rich diet is going to kind of counterbalance that. And I think no food is just a hundred percent saturated yeah. fat. Every food has a mix of different nutrients. So we're not just eating saturated fat on its own. Um, but you can eat foods that are higher or lower in saturated fat. Yeah. And for some people, it may be beneficial to, to eat a, a lower saturated fat diet. For other healthy people, maybe it's not even something that needs to be on your radar because your overall pattern yeah. is, is quite balanced. And, and then it also comes down to, doesn't it, like what's your current state of health? So mm -hmm. if you have, for whatever reason, had a lot of insults to your body, whether it's stress, poor diets, inadequate movement, insomnia, mm -hmm. maybe you work night shifts for, for 20 years or whatever. Maybe at that point, maybe the gut 
is a little bit more leaky than mm-hmm. um than we would call physiological or, or yeah. normal or optimal maybe in that context foods can start to become problematic yeah. On the background of that, compared to someone who's got their their health and their microbiome yeah. in a completely different state. Yeah, exactly. And, and I, I really, I so strongly feel that that nuance is getting lost in health communication. I really think it, it gets lost on social media a lot mm-hmm. of the time, where things have become black and white. Yeah. So it's like, and, and I don't know. I, I I I am heavily influenced by my experience as a clinician seeing mm-hmm. patients. I've just realised that. It's very hard to say one thing for sure that is applicable in every single situation. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I guess that's where, you know, we're not <laughs> going to be able to deliver personalized diets to everyone, but we can help sort of nurture intuition and, yeah, yeah and steer well, people towards the, the helpful. I thought for you to be a very small part of this discussion. <laughs> we spent a long time on food. So I think overall pattern, mm-hmm. lots of diversity. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we've covered a few things there. Uh, depending how long we've got, I'd love to talk about stress, mm-hmm. emotions, mm-hmm. Um, the idea of hormesis, hot stress, cold stress. Yeah. Like, these are really interesting. So yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know, which one do you want to go yeah, to? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess I start by saying I'm a natural stress head. I don't know <laughs> why, but I, I I get stressed very easily by things that I probably shouldn't. I think I, I my husband's the opposite end of the spectrum. So sometimes he's like, why, why is she getting so uh, worried um, about things that she doesn't need to worry about? So it's always on my radar because I know that if I let it run away with me, I will start to feel the detrimental effects of stress. In, um, in what way? I think the biggest example was um, the time I gave myself pneumonia, <laughs> which is um, wow. uh, kind of embarrassing. But I was very stressed. I had, I, I wasn't someone who grew up understanding what boundaries were. Maybe that was my generation. But I'm, I'm someone who like, I enjoy what I do. So I get excited about pro- projects. I take on everything. I say yes to everything. So I'm like, that sounds amazing. That sounds amazing. Then I have to realize I, I have a job. I have kids. I have to have downtime. I need to spend time with family and friends, you know, all the other life admin and life load that comes with it. And, um, and it was a couple of years ago, I got cold. My husband got the cold as well. My son got the cold. My daughter didn't, which probably could have another tangent about why (laughs) even though we're all coughing on her um and they got better and I I took no time off I was working every evening to finish deadlines on various projects um and I wasn't sleeping well because I was going to bed a bit wired from Working. working and not able to switch off my brain and thinking about what I had to get done tomorrow because I had other deadlines and other things and then going to work and I had this awful hacking cough. This is pre-COVID, so <laughs> definitely wasn't COVID. And um, I was starting to hide it from my colleagues <laughs> and my family. I was trying to pretend that I was fine. I was just feeling awful. My chest was rattling and then I just couldn't get out of bed one day and I, I couldn't take care of my kids. I feel quite emotional talking about it actually um, because I was just there. I, I, I just literally... I, I've never had the sort of bone rack, rattling, chesty cough, yeah. um, fever, I, and I was in bed for three weeks. Wow. And, you know, all of those deadlines, my job, my kids, I couldn't do any of it. And I, I just ignored a cold and I kept on going anyway. And I was so stressed and I didn't stop and recognize that I was stressed and the trickle down effect yeah. it was having on all the other behaviors and that I was engaging in, like my sleep and everything. And that was, a, you know. I mean, a, a very powerful story. And thank you for opening <laughs> up and sharing it. I can see it's still, yeah. you know, it's, it, it is very emotional. Um, so that's your immune system getting completely flawed. Mm-hmm. So what's going on there? I mean, let's break that down. You were overworked, overstressed, not sleeping well. Mm-hmm. And all those things are impacting your immune system. Yeah. So what, what is going on? I think that one of the most interesting things was I was probably eating pretty well because I love cooking and it's part of my sort of thing that I, I enjoy doing. So that in itself is just evidence that even if you have the best diet in the world, you know, 
other things kind of rode away at your immune system and and leave you open and stress is probably the one thing i know that it's something that you've written about a lot and it's the one thing that we don't take seriously we think of it as being psychological and the causes can be psychological they can be physical they can be emotional but they're always biological because the stress chemistry is real the things that are being produced in our body that give us that stress response um that is having a really real impact on our body and i've come to really start to think about how i can make stress a positive in my life because ultimately it's the thing that gets us out of bed in the morning it gives us the get up and go to go and do yeah. things um and what I've been learning about my own journey is when you reflect on events, you describe them as stressful if they were negative, but you describe them as something else if they worked out, you know, well for you. So as a society, we, we think of stress as being um, a negative thing. But if you, uh, there's experiments that have been done where they take groups of students before a presentation and they're being told to recite kind of positive affirmations or or negative affirmations about what they're about to do and this has a huge impact yeah. on their stress chemistry but also there's a trickle down effect on your immune system yeah. because stress is you know designed to save your life so you're about to be hit by a bus you're going to run for your life you're you're uh, you know within seconds you're switching on that um adrenaline response to to mobilize you yeah. to safety. Then we have cortisol, one of the key stress hormones that's going to keep you running, keep you going. It's going to pump glucose into your bloodstream so you've got instant energy to, to go and take yourself from safety. That's all energetically costly. And that's saying, well, you've got a cold, but we're going to stop fighting the cold right now because we need to save your life. So turn off the immune system and turn on all the other stuff yeah. that needs to save your life. So cortisol um, is is sort of like the off switch for protecting ourselves. And, yeah. and it really dampens our immune system. And that's okay if it's for you know a series of hours. But when it's hours and days and months and over the long term, then you're constantly kind of running, running on empty. Yeah, it's, I mean, I, I'm, I'm glad you shared your story and I'm glad you're making a point of this because I think in health and wellness in general, there mm -hmm. is, you know, I'm a big fan that food is important. I yeah. think there is far too much focus on foods mm -hmm. at the expense of other Facts as well. And many people, yeah. frankly, their diet is good enough. Mm -hmm. And trying to make a 5% improve in their diet, they're much better off trying to address their stress levels yeah. or their sleep quality. Getting it, getting an extra half an hour sleep a night yeah. is probably going to do them more good than tweaking their diet by an extra 5%. Exactly. And, and I really think we've got the balance wrong. And I think that's also because at the way we talk about stress and how we see it in society mm -hmm. and our food, you can see that it's on your plates, right? You, see, yeah. you can see food, you can see the choice. Exactly. But, you know, you mentioned that, I mean, that was a pneumonia. I, you know, my dad, who, who I spent 15 years caring for, dad, when he were, you know, he was a, uh, he was a, he was a consultant doctor in this country. Um, but he, you know, he worked stupid hours, mm -hmm. right? He had a he, he did two jobs. He had a full time job as a consultant. He also worked nights, four days a week, in mm -hmm. another sort of medical job. So, for thirty years, my dad only sat three nights a week. Which, wow. and and you know, when dad was, I think, in his sort of mid to late fifties, he suddenly got unwell. He'd never been unwell before, mm -hmm. and boom. All our lives changed. He came down with lupus, mm -hmm. kidney failure, and then that was 15 years of dialysis. That was me moving back to the oh, Northwest. Goodness. It was, it's really impacted my whole adult life. And I now, the more I delve into research and the Im impacts of stress mm -hmm. on your immune system, the impacts of sleep deprivation mm -hmm. on your immune system, but also emotions and mm -hmm. things like anger and pent up stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, of course my dad got lupus, right? And, and, Someone might say to me, oh, you can't prove that. Okay, sure. But I don't need to. Like in my head, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like I don't have to prove that to him. I know looking at my dad's life that that sort of lifestyle, and I love my dad. I love what he's done for the family, mm -hmm. right? So I understand he was doing what he yeah. felt he had to do to give us a great yeah. life, and he has. But it came at a cost. Yeah. And as you said before, there is a cost to the immune system doing yeah. what it does. There is a cost. And I think in my dad's cost, mm -hmm. chronic stress, chronic insomnia, mm -hmm. I 
I'm convinced led to his lupus. Yeah. Um, now, and there's so many anecdotes that I hear all the time of people saying there was a stressful event or there was something that happened or I lost a, a partner or, you know, and, and that was a turning point in my health started to decline and nothing else changed but the stress. I, 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 then, I, I do a timeline with my patients, right? And, and I can tell you when people come down with an autoimmune illness, when you go back into the whole mm -hmm. history... And again, I'm skewed by my patient population. Yeah. So this may not be applicable to everyone, but in my patient population, when I draw a timeline, it is amazing how many times within six months of them getting symptoms, some significant life stressor happened. Mm -hmm. Could have been a lost job, yeah. bereavement, breakup. It was, it's almost like stress can sometimes not only be a contributor, it's sometimes it can be the trigger. The trigger, yeah. Everything else was waiting there. And it, it has all the, the trickle down effects as well. When I'm stressed, like I said before, I wasn't sleeping very well because there's a trickle down effect and you're more likely to engage in negative behaviors. So most people, when they're stressed, they might say, oh, I'm just eating really badly because I'm stressed. It's a major kind of driver of, um, uh, you know, these negative behaviors that are, uh, then you're in a sort of vicious cycle of things. And you you, you are. And, and at the moment, people are beating themselves up that they put on weight during this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I really want to sort of say with heartfelt compassion to people, you really don't have to because um, that there's a study from about 10 years ago, which showed that, you know, maybe 80% of us change our eating behavior in response to stress. And it's mm -hmm. roughly... I think it's roughly 45% of us eat more mm -hmm. and 35% of us eat less. Yeah, I can we imagine that. I've got friends who say, oh, I, when I'm stressed, I can't eat. Yeah. And then there's other people who eat too as much as a way. Yeah. yeah. And so, of course, in one of the most stressful month, you know, few months, mm -hmm. in, in certainly my lifetime and many people's lifetimes, mm -hmm. Well, of course, there's going to be a certain population who are wired yeah. to use food to soothe their stress. Yeah. Um, I know I've heard you talk about before that stress impacts the the microbiome, the the gut bugs, mm -hmm. but it also impacts the stress the, the cortisol receptor, doesn't it? Yes, yeah, it's kind of like you're you're constantly revving your engine, but you've got your foot on the brake at the same time, and it, it's you know we have ways and means of switching off the stress response, but that circuit gets worn out a little bit when it's constantly at play, and everything just starts to get um, off balance yeah. from then, and because you know our immune system cells have receptors for all of the different hormones, stress chemistry, they're being influenced by that as well. It's influencing the production of fresh new immune cells from the bone marrow. So things like cortisol can have a sort of dampening effect on that. Um, and there's a concept of the immunological space. I'm not sure if you've heard of this, but we only have so much space in our body for immune cells. And over your lifespan, your immune cells, you know, proliferate when we see an infection or we sort of gather up more and more immune cells until it becomes full. And we kind of have to wait for the old ones to die off before our body can produce fresh new ones. And older immune cells are more likely to go wrong. So we need to have a way of getting rid of the old ones and bringing in the new ones. And so this kind of balance um, can be really interrupted by being stressed out all the time. Is there anything you do yourself having experienced the negatives of burning the candle at both yeah. ends? You're know, really trying to say yes to everyone and do everything. Oh, that's <laughs> the hardest lesson. Uh, yeah, getting pneumonia <laughs> yeah. when you couldn't do anything. What if you, as an immunologist yourself, but also well, as a human who's susceptible to the same pressures yeah. as all of us, what have you changed? I've tried to be a bit more open because I hate seeing in, in the wellness sphere people looking like their life is perfect and I just think we all get it wrong even you know my colleagues were like how on earth do you end up letting yourself get pneumonia like it's so stupid letting, even though <laughs> yeah, I'm exactly. just letting yourself <laughs> like come on you should know better um I went on a bit of a journey to this just look at what what helps stress um and some I obviously went into the research first of all just being a scientist <laughs> and what I found was um you know it, there's sort of cultural aspects to our immune system and what I mean by that is you know um I was writing about this the other day like the act of writing stuff down like disclosing stressful events or traumatic events is is seen as being 
very uh, cathartic and good for our health. But what we don't realize is this is through a sort of Western perspective. And in some cultures, writing is actually more stressful because it becomes vi visual on the, the page. Somebody might read it, even if you know it's private. And that can be more stressful. And it can alter the stress chemistry. It can also alter things like their immune cells and how well they're working and how many colds and flus they're likely to pick up that year. So when I think about the current pandemic and how we know that certain populations are more susceptible to severe COVID, so the black and minority ethnic groups. And instantly we try and look at the biology of why is that? And then we realize that it could be cultural things. The stress of um, not having, uh, you know, living up to sort of cultural norms yeah. of how you live your lifestyle or not having the cultural norms of how you relieve your stress or what a support network looks like. It can be quite stressful is, for people. That is one of the most interesting things I've heard, Janet. It's, it's, it's like, you know, I'm a huge fan of journaling. I think journaling can help so many people. Mm -hmm. But if you're journaling and you're worried that someone's going to see what you've written, mm -hmm. well, that's a whole different experience. Yeah. Like, yes. and, and what's interesting is you're saying that your immune system senses that yeah. and alters what it does based upon that perception. Exactly. So, Which so is kind of mind-blowing, it, it, isn't mind it? It's mind-blowing, but then it's it also, it can either be frustrating for people or empowering. Mm -hmm. It basically means everything we do, the thoughts we think, the emotions yeah. we feel. Yeah. Uh, and you've got this lovely bit, I think I've probably got it open here, you know, as above, so below, emotional roots of disease. And it's page 160 of your book. Like, I really like what you put there and how, um, you know, you know, and you, you sort of say much of the medical community remains skeptical, yeah. but there's piling evidence that virtually every ill from the common cold to cancer and heart disease is influenced mm -hmm. positively or negatively by a person's emotional and mental state. And yeah. you're saying we can no longer ignore this connection. Yeah. It's just the hardest thing to study because, you know, it's subjective, it's it's fuzzy. It's 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 not any of that hard empirical data. But, but, but if data. you ask any like the 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 experienced clinicians who I'm friend mm -hmm. with friends with, um, we all get it because mm -hmm. we've seen it. Now I get there's a there's often a disconnect between what we see clinically and what we're able to study and quantify. Yeah, but I got to tell you, you know, you see this. All, all the time, and, and you sort of you summarize. I think what was what was the quote? It's far more important to know what person the disease what what person the disease. What, what was the quote? Yeah, so it's more important to know what person the disease has than what disease the person has. So it's kind of who is the person first and foremost. And there's a really uh, That's interesting, isn't it? yeah, yeah. There's a really interesting study that. Um, it looked at sort of these five major personality types. So they are kind of roughly divided into like openness to experience, conscientiousness, extrovertedness, agreeableness, and neuroticism. So in psychology terms, they're kind of ways that we can be categorized based on our personality. Um, and each of these personality types have specific immunological features. And one of the most interesting thing is that um, some of them are more likely to be pro-inflammatory and have higher levels of C-reactive protein, which is a marker in the blood for, for inflammation. Um, and things like being neurotic and um, being uh, sort of less introverted, it can affect the inflammation in our body. It's because I guess we're all very different. We're all on a sort of spectrum of different personalities, but that's evolved from maybe different roles you might play within a community. Um, and then what your exposure to different infections might be or your risk of getting injured. Um, things like anger is known to prime the body for um, for becoming damaged because maybe anger preceded violence. And throughout our evolution, we've like, okay, if you're angry, something might happen that might damage you. So we need to prime parts of our immune system to prepare for that. You mentioned anger and it's something I wrote about Feel Better in Five is the importance of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. There is good research on forgiveness. A guy yeah. called Fred Luskin's done the Stanford University, I think, forgiveness trial or research. That I can't remember the exact name. Yeah. His research is incredible. And I I shared in my last book a story about one of my patients who had high blood pressure. 
And which again, you know, to, to, to make it relevant to our conversation, you know, high blood pressure is a chronic, mm -hmm. non-communicable illness that, you know, will have chronic inflammation yeah. playing a role yeah. in some way. And you know what? She had changed her lifestyle. I was, you know, I was doing this stuff. I try and uh, talk about food and movement and sleep. And you know what? It wasn't budging. Mm -hmm. And it was to do with, um, you know, basically her, um, her husband of many years had cheated on her and yeah. they had split up. And it was only once she started practicing forgiveness, mm -hmm. right, that her blood pressure started going down. It, it was incredible. And so uh, that's a, like, that's an anecdotal story from yeah. my clinic, but I, it really, I think it does stand uh, firm mm -hmm. and consistent with the research that is out there in terms of if you're holding on to resentment yeah. and anger, that will influence your biology yeah. and your immune system. Exactly. And it, maybe that is culturally what we see dividing different groups and how they deal with illness as well because they may feel uh, marginalized. I think social status is also really important. I know that in the animal kingdom, being lower down the pecking order can be quite stressful for an animal and that can be seen in its its blood chemistry, but also for us humans. Um, and I think that's yeah. you know, something that we see playing out with the sort of lower socioeconomic um, uh, demographics are worse hit by some of these lifestyle related diseases. Yeah, and, they may have more stressful lifestyles and But we always we put it down, don't we, to oh less access to good food, more stress. And of course I think those play a role. Mm -hmm. But what if it's also related to status as it is yeah. in the animal kingdom? What you yeah. know, that's something I hadn't probably given as much thought to and it's probably not as common a narrative. It's how, where do you I guess it's, you know, in many ways, it's, do you feel your life has purpose? Yes. Yeah. Do you know, how do you see your life? What's the meaning behind it? Because that as well in itself has a huge amount of research suggesting, it's a, you know, if you feel your life has meaning and value, you tend to have a happier and healthier life. Yeah. I mean, another piece of research that came across recently was comparing um, Samoan individuals to European individuals with um, Epstein-Barr virus, which is a virus that almost all of us harbor. But when we activate our stress chemistry, um, this can be actually a sign that the virus uses to allow itself to reactivate and, and cause problems. And we know in the Western culture that being of a lower socioeconomic status means that you're more likely to experience viral reactivation. But in the Samoan culture, um, being of a lower socioeconomic status has a totally different impact on the stress chemistry that actually meant it was the people in the higher socioeconomic bracket that were worse affected by latent viral reactivation. And this is just, a, you know, they use the viral reactivation as a sort of readout, an empirical way of, of measuring the immune system changes. But it, it, different cultures, you know, you and we never think about this yeah. in medicine. I mean, it's, what's that like for you as a scientist and as a lecturer? These are the kind of... Yeah, these would be these would be perceived as a kind of softer yes, yeah. aspects of health and science, but it's you know that, that data to, is data, right? Exactly. We need to bring it together. A lot of the data is actually quite old now, but I guess it's just been parked there. And we have this real kind of biomedical model where we focus in on one cell type and what is that cell doing, and it's really reductionist. And then we try and piece the jigsaw together, and we kind of need to fuse it with the anthropology and be like, okay, now how do we bring these two fields together? Because that's the only way we can tackle, I think, where we're at yeah. with our health. And and you know. You, you sort of, you, you really beautifully bridge it throughout the book, all these different components, mm -hmm. emotions, food, movement, sleep, stress, yeah. you know, you, it's got a nice section on supplements as well, which you probably won't be able to get into today. Um, and but the, um, the joy of the table, so the gioia de tavola, which is an Italian phrase for enjoying being at the table. And linking what we were talking about earlier with food to emotions you know make your table a joyous place to be because the endorphins from enjoying being at your table with your family your friends or even on your own and just enjoying the meal endorphins 
can alter the function of our immune cells because they have receptors for those on them. So those feel-good hormones, that actually helps nurture things like the Tregs, the regulatory T cells. So bringing the food together with the emotion and, and enjoying that, that's so, so important. I mean, yeah. we haven't had a kitchen for the last four months, so we've had no table, <laughs> no joy, but we've still been trying to cobble together as a family, you know, little meals on the floor. And it's, it's just... It, 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 you know what? I'm so delighted to hear you speak about these things because I think these are things we've missed mm -hmm. in health advice. Yeah. It has been too reductionist. You know, eating at a table with, you know, your community, your yeah. tribe has kind of always been a part of human culture. Yeah. And, I, and I think in, in, if you sort of extend the argument that you're making, it's kind of like, well, you could potentially eat the same food, mm -hmm. feeling stressed out and lonely. Yeah. And the same food might have a different response if you're eating it with good friends when you're feeling relaxed and yeah. calm. Exactly. I, I, I'm convinced of it. You know, one thing I've really I, I've observed clinically, maybe for two, three years mm -hmm. now, a lot of people these days are reacting or, or perceive themselves as reacting to foods. Yes. And I think. What's really interesting for me is, and I think I really got this in the year preceding me writing The Stress Solution, was I thought, well, if stress changes your uh, your guts and your GI tracts and your, your mm -hmm. digestion significantly as it does, well, are they actually reacting to the food or are they reacting to the fact that they're eating in a stressed state? And I've mm -hmm. seen with some patients the same food, if they do some sort of what I call a transition mm -hmm. between, you know, action states and eating, when they do that for one or two minutes before eating, yeah. they're no longer reacting to the same foods. Yeah. Which, you know, it's... I think this has even been shown with gluten as the nocebo effect, yeah. which I don't know, people say this all the time. I go on holiday, I can eat the bread. It doesn't make me feel bloated, but the bread at home must be somehow different. Maybe it's different, but also you're different. You're in a different frame of mind when you're on holiday and you're eating and you're chewing your food as you look at the lovely vista and you're yeah. just feeling more relaxed and that's affecting your digestion. This, that, this and, stuff matters yeah. more than people think. You know, when I, I really don't, I hardly pretty much don't drink anymore. Um, but when I did, I used to remember that I'd go on holiday and like, you know, a glass of red wine would affect my sleep in the UK or, mm -hmm. you know, I'd feel a bit groggy the next day. But I found when I was on holiday, I could have a glass or two with dinner yeah. and I felt nothing. Yeah. I thought, this is stress. This is like, <laughs> there's no like stress load on my life. I'm yeah. sort of chilling with my wife and my kids and there's a beach. Yeah. So it's not bothering me. But if your life is chronically overly busy, you're stressed out yeah. the whole time, not only are you going to get sick more yes. or potentially, you know, you're going to be able to not tolerate yeah. various things. You're going to, you're going to, you're not going to be able to manage those insults as well. Right? Exactly. I call it the food prison. You know, I see so many people who are so stressed about eating the perfect diet that that's, that's just eroding their health. Never mind what they're eating, yeah. being, being helpful. Um, but I guess, you know, you asked me earlier about what I do to manage my stress. And I think it's my, it's still my learning curve, but it's just on my radar now that I'm, I'm, I'm always experimenting. I'm learning how to say no. I think having boundaries was one of the biggest things I, I learned as an adult. Like, why are we not teaching kids this in school? And saying no is okay. And there's a time and a place for projects. If yeah. I want to get involved and it, it can't be now because that compromises my time as a mother or my time spent with family or my time just, you know, being on my own or doing the things that yeah. nurture my day, then I have to say no and let go of that. And yeah. I guess that's like, you know, the catharticism of writing or some ways of, you know, putting a narrative to what's stressing us out has a release to yeah. it. And that you can feel that, you know, like a big physiological sigh that your body is making when you're like, okay. And once the decision's made, you move on from yeah. it. I've said no to that. It's sad. And I wish I could say yes, but I don't think about it the next day when I've moved on and other things are, you know, it's very freeing actually, mm -hmm. you know, it's something I've struggled with for years and it's, I'm getting much better at it, but it's, it feels good. Yeah. You, half the time I used to say yes to stuff and then 
I would just be stressed out. Why did I say yes? I've got to do this. I've committed now. They've yeah. started advertising it. They don't. And, I, and I'm, I'm getting much better at nipping it in the bud yeah. at source. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, and it's, but it's taken a lot of work. Oh, yeah. I had to learn the hard way. Yeah. Um, but the, I started feeling like I was doing everything badly. And when you start to feel like you're being a bad parent, probably I wasn't, but in my mind, I wasn't yeah. doing what I wanted to do. And that, I think, with my kids, I just, that had to be a firm line that yeah. I couldn't ever cross again. Wow. Now, you mentioned eating, and you said um, that, you know, there's some studies that our immune system operates differently if we're eating in company, feeling joy, feeling mm -hmm. happy. That reminds me of something else I read in your book about, it's something to do with you were giving a, a list of strategies to people, but it was about, you know, like walking whilst listening to music. It was about putting two senses in together. Oh, yes. I, that, oh, I yeah. found really interesting. Could you expand on that at yeah, all? Yeah, that, this is it's really interesting, actually. So this was um, data that was generated in the 1980s. There was some scientists who were trying to disprove research that had come out of Russia around that time about conditioning. So the classical example of conditioning is Pavlov's dogs. Um, most people will be aware of that. But there, these experiments they had done where they, they had looked to try and condition the immune system. And so these scientists were like, this, this can't be right. Uh, you know, we, we're going to redo the experiments much more stringently and um, see if it is really what it makes out to be. Can you condition your immune system with various rituals and routines? And what they did was they, they used an animal uh, model experiment and they gave the, the animals a, a sweet solution to drink and uh, one group got the sweet solution that also had a particular chemical inside it that would modulate antibody responses. So they could measure the antibody responses in the blood and see um, if uh, uh, that there was an effect ha happening, some kind of readout, tangible piece of data that they could observe. Um, so the mice were given these this sugar solution with this chemical for a period of time. And after a while, when they just gave the sugar solution on its own, they got the same effect happening to the immune system. So it's kind of like a placebo effect. Wow. It's like you expect something, the mouse expected this effect to take place in its body on some kind of subconscious level because it was so used to that happening that the, the effect happened anyway, even without the chemical presence to actually cause the modulation to the immune system. And people have been scratching around to try and understand the mechanism. And I think the best we've come up with is the placebo effect. Like it's, it's, there's some part of us that we don't quite understand that embodies things. And when there's a response expected, that the biology changes and we can start to pair things together. So what you're referring to in the book is like the kind of little stress relieving rituals, like, you know, playing your favorite music whilst you're doing something like taking a, a nice bath or having a particular scent being in the room yeah. while you're doing something else. And eventually then you just can play that music and you start to feel the same relaxed feeling that you do when you're in a nice warm bath, even without taking the bath. Yeah. You know, it makes me think about, you know, if your home is or has been a stressful place, mm -hmm. then, you know, that it kind of works that you may come into that and you, your body may start to yeah. almost the immune system might sense that and go, okay, yeah. this is a stressful place and, and react even if nothing stressful happens. Yeah. But then you could also flip it. And, you know, I'm a huge fan of ritual and sort of daily mm -hmm. practices that even if they only take five minutes, yeah. they can be very powerful. And I think when I hear that, I think of a morning routine and I think, what if someone, you know, can design their ideal morning routine? Let's say, let's say it was five, 10 minutes, yeah. you know, a bit of maybe a minute or two of breathing, yeah. um, you know, three or four minutes of some light movement practice. Yeah. And then let's say five minutes of reading a positive book. Yeah. For example, I mean, that's, you know, I, I in the stress station, I write about the three M's of a morning routine, mindfulness, movement, and mindsets. Mm -hmm. I think you can create one that lasts an hour. You can create one that lasts five minutes. But the point I'm trying to make is if someone started doing that in the same room, let's say they lit a candle yeah. in the room, did that, that even on a day when they're a little bit busy or they haven't, 
quite they can't quite yeah. switch off and they just you know sat there with their coffee with the candle on yes maybe that will also condition their immune system the other way and go hey things are okay because exactly. he's got the candle on i yeah. don't know it's quite it's, it's quite empowering smell, all the senses kind of integrating so it might be particular scent that you're burning there might be particular song or playlist that you always play when you're doing those uh, activities for your morning routine and then the morning you wake up and you're just tired and you don't want to do your movement you just want to sit and enjoy a tea but you're in that room with that yeah. space and you're still maybe reaping the benefits of the, the meditation and the yeah. movement that you would normally do. And I think routine, as, a, as a human being, we just seem to be anchored by routines. Yeah. For me, especially becoming a mother, it's been it's been hugely important. So much so that now I can buffer the lack of routine more because I can circle back to a really strong routine yeah. that I've built over time. And I think when we went into lockdown this year, everything kind of got off kilter and we haven't we, we're living in a building site basically at the moment yeah, so that's stressful the, right it's stressful the routine is is shock you know you shot it's really done a number on us but i think having been someone who needs routine particularly as a bit of a stress head it didn't take long for us to find a new yeah. rhythm uh it's, being I, at home and that's anchoring i think that's i i, I love the way you the way you say certain things you said you know we can build a routine mm -hmm. like you can build your immune system yeah it's a, it's a very empowering words you yeah know, build means we can do that right yes. it doesn't mean it's fixed exactly we've, we've got some agency over that yeah um it's really interesting as, as you know as, as i mentioned right at the start this is you know day one in the new studio yeah and gareth who's videoing uh, and sitting there in the corner um we've been talking about you know, how do we create a stress-free space mm -hmm. that allows a really deep, authentic, vulnerable conversation to happen? Yeah. And, you know, it's not quite ready yet. You know, bringing plants in is yeah. one thing, you know, mm -hmm. um, we're going to probably have a candle on or some sort yeah. of, you know, a nice scent. Yeah. You know, my, my dream is because my, this podcast is all about authentic conversation. It's mm -hmm. not interviews, it's conversation. I want, um, someone like you to walk in and within you know i almost want to program it so that people feel calm and they go mm -hmm. they want to open up and actually yeah do you know what i mean yeah you know? i think you've done a really good job already oh. but also i think the what you give off as a person really helps so the way people's eyes feel relaxed you know when we're angry we like narrow our eyes or if we're yeah. feeling quite negative or stress and then we pick that up when we're sort of reading the body language. Yeah. And so if somebody has a sort of relaxed disposition, that's going to be interpreted yeah. by the other person and make them feel at ease as well. So And interpreted by our immune systems. Yes, exactly. You know. As this is a safe environment. It's all about all of those millions of inputs that are going in yeah. every minute of every day and our immune systems reading those, shaping and responding. Jenna, look, I've really enjoyed this chat. There is so much I want to discover that we've not got into yet, like hot and cold and oh, supplements, yes. which is, it's all there in the book for people <laughs> if they're interested. Movements and how that impacts the immune yeah. system. But, but I, I really enjoyed, thank you for opening up. Oh, no um, problem. If people hear this conversation and mm -hmm. they want to sort of interact with you, are you sort of, um, you know, are you active online? Do you like interacting with people online? And if so, where can they find you? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm on uh, Instagram mostly. That's sort of the easiest place to find me. That's kind of my um, internal monologue where I, uh, uh, I don't know, like to post about things that I've been researching yeah. and doing and also a bit of kind of general mum life and <laughs> a little bit of what's going on at home um, as well. I, I'm sort of on Twitter on a professional capacity. So that's mostly like, publishing research and yeah. interacting with academics. Um, and then I have a website too, which is just my name, which is Dr. Jenna Machocki.com. Fantastic. Um, so Jenna, as you know, this is called Feel Better, Live More. Mm -hmm. um, when we feel better in ourselves, mm -hmm. we get more out of our lives. Mm -hmm. So we covered a lot of different um, topics today, a lot we didn't cover as well. I wonder if you'd mind finishing off by 
giving the listeners and the viewers some really practical tips if they're inspired by what they've heard Mm -hmm. i don't want to say yeah i like that i I want to take steps today to start improving my immune system have you got some of the top tips that you can share with them I would say shut out the noise, the noise of social media, the noise of marketing, the noise of messages, and just kind of write down or find a way to 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 um, distill down, you know, what what it is about your day to day that you think is is making you feel a bit nah, a bit like not yourself, um, because we're we're bombarded with so much. And when I speak to people, I realize I'm in a very privileged position because of the virtue of my field and that I work in that I know a lot, but other people who are with no background at all in this, they're very confused and it's very confusing. Um, and go with what, what we talked about, you know, step away from the supplements and just lay out on the table. How is your diet? How many times a day are you eating? Are you overeating? Are you stress eating? Are you consistently getting, all of the relevant vitamins and minerals that you need, but also good quality sources of carbohydrates and proteins and including um, good quality fats in your diet. And, you know, diet is not the only way to, to shape your immune system. You know, we have movement, stress, all of the different things in our in our life and, and your immune system is always changing. As we grow older, it changes, you know, don't really focus on one solution because health is complex. There's a lot of different inputs going into it. Your immune system is the foundation of your health. And so it needs to have all these kind of different areas targeted. So you can have the perfect diet, but like me, stressed out of your head and then end up with pneumonia. Don't do as I did, but you know, take care, take care of the, the whole sort of 360 of your health. And it's about balancing, not boosting your immune system. Yeah. Wonderful advice. Um, you know, I want to thank you for, you know, you, you study a lot of immunology, you you've, you do a lot of research, you also take the time to communicate it to the public. Mm-hmm. And I think that's such a valuable thing if we get scientists like you yeah. trying to communicate what you know to help educate people. I think it's a wonderful thing. So mm-hmm. thank you for doing that. You're thank welcome. you for making the journey up today. No problem. And we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Press subscribe to get more inspiration and ideas on how to feel better so you can get more out of life. And if you have a moment, why not check out this conversation that I've picked out as a perfect follow-up. Remember, lifestyle change is always worth it because when you feel better, you live more.